that uh, I know when we were doing the 600 mil Sony video, he was shooting mm -hmm. pieces to camera with Will. I want to talk about that a little bit as well. Um, that kind of different format, how you found that. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm down. Sweet. Uh, we'll, we'll have it into it. Let's cut it off. I, I'm, I'm sure I'll see you guys in the next few weeks. So. All right, yeah. Thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you in the next show. Later. SARS-CoV-2 in a nursing facility, Olaparib for metastatic prostate cancer, P10 defects from WWP1 activation, liraglutide for adolescents with obesity, and label testing for over-the-counter naloxone sales, a review article on acute on chronic liver failure, a case report of a man with COVID-19 and acute kidney injury, and perspective articles on harnessing our humanity, on sharing health data and biospecimens with industry, on flattening the curve for incarcerated populations, and on blood ties. At NEJM.org, we feature a new interactive medical case. In The Game is Afoot, a 63-year-old woman with a history of multiple fractures presents with progressively worsening pain in both ankles and difficulty walking. Test your diagnostic and therapeutic skills at NEJM.org. Also at NEJM.org, a video in clinical medicine shows how to obtain a nasopharyngeal swab specimen. Visit NEJM.org slash coronavirus to view this video. Presymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infections and transmission in a skilled nursing facility by Melissa Ahrens from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Atlanta. After identification of a case of COVID-19 in a skilled nursing facility, the authors assessed transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and evaluated the adequacy of symptom-based screening in residents. 23 days after the first positive test result in a resident, 57 of 89 residents, 64%, tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. Among 76 residents who participated in point prevalence surveys, 63% tested positive. Of these 48 residents, 56% were asymptomatic at the time of testing. 24 subsequently developed symptoms, median time to onset, four days. Samples from these 24 pre-symptomatic residents had a median real-time RT-PCR cycle threshold value of 23.1, and viable virus was recovered from 17 residents. As of April 3rd, of the 57 residents with SARS-CoV-2 infection, 11 had been hospitalized, 3 in the ICU, and 15 had died. Mortality, 26%. Of the 34 residents whose specimens were sequenced, 79% had sequences that fit into two clusters with a difference of one nucleotide. Rapid and widespread transmission of SARS-CoV-2 was demonstrated in this skilled nursing facility. More than half of residents with positive test results were asymptomatic at the time of testing and most likely contributed to transmission. Infection control strategies focused solely on symptomatic residents were not sufficient to prevent transmission after SARS-CoV-2 introduction into this facility. Monica Gandhi from the University of California, San Francisco, writes in an editorial that asymptomatic transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is the Achilles heel of COVID-19 pandemic control through the public health strategies we have currently deployed. Symptom-based screening has utility, but epidemiologic evaluations of COVID-19 outbreaks within skilled nursing facilities, such as the one described by Aaron's and colleagues, strongly demonstrate that our current approaches are inadequate. This recommendation for SARS-CoV-2 testing of asymptomatic persons in skilled nursing facilities should most likely be expanded to other congregate living situations, such as prisons and jails, where outbreaks in the United States have been increasing, enclosed mental health facilities, and homeless shelters, and to hospitalized inpatients. Current U.S. testing capability must increase immediately for this strategy to be implemented. Ultimately, the rapid spread of COVID-19 across the United States and the globe, the clear evidence of SARS-CoV-2 transmission from asymptomatic persons, and the eventual need to relax current social distancing practices, argue for broadened SARS-CoV-2 testing to include asymptomatic persons in prioritized settings. These factors also support the case for the general public to use face masks when in crowded outdoor or indoor spaces. This unprecedented pandemic calls for unprecedented measures to achieve its ultimate defeat.
Olaparib for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer by Johan de Bono from the Institute of Cancer Research and Royal Marsden Hospital, London, the United Kingdom. This phase three trial evaluated the PARP inhibitor Olaparib in men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who had disease progression while receiving a new hormonal agent, such as enzalutamide or abiraterone. Cohort A, 245 patients, had at least one alteration in BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM. Cohort B, 142 patients, had alterations in any of 12 other pre-specified genes. Patients were randomly assigned to receive olaparib or the physician's choice of enzalutamide or abiraterone control group. In cohort A, imaging-based progression-free survival was significantly longer in the olaparib group than in the control group, median 7.4 months versus 3.6 months. A significant benefit was also observed with respect to the confirmed objective response rate and the time to pain progression. The median overall survival in cohort A was 18.5 months in the elaborate group and 15.1 months in the control group. 81% of the patients in the control group who had progression crossed over to receive elaborate. A significant benefit for olaparib was also seen for imaging-based progression-free survival in the overall population. Anemia and nausea were the main toxic effects in patients who received olaparib. In these men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, olaparib was associated with longer progression-free survival and better measures of response and patient-reported endpoints than either enzalutamide or abiraterone. WWP1 gain of function inactivation of P10 in cancer predisposition by Yu Ru Li from Beth Israel Deaconess Cancer Center, Boston. Patients with P10 hamartoma tumor syndrome, PHTS, have germline mutations in the tumor suppression gene encoding phosphatase and tensin homolog, P10. Such mutations have been associated with a hereditary predisposition to multiple types of cancer, including the Cowden syndrome. However, a majority of patients who have PHTS-related phenotypes have tested negative for P10 mutations. In a previous study, the investigators found that the E3 ubiquitin ligase, WWP1, negatively regulates the function of P10. In this study, involving patients with disorders resulting in a predisposition to the development of multiple malignant neoplasms without P10 germline mutations, the investigators confirmed the function of WWP1 as a cancer susceptibility gene through direct aberrant regulation of the P10-PI3K signaling axis. These findings have important implications for cancer prevention and therapy since WWP1 and the pathway it regulates are potential therapeutic targets whereas targeting P10 has not been feasible in clinical practice to date. A randomized control trial of liraglutide for adolescents with obesity by Aaron Kelly from the University of Minnesota Medical School, Minneapolis. In this trial, with a 56-week treatment period, 251 adolescents with obesity and a poor response to lifestyle therapy alone were randomly assigned to receive either liraglutide or placebo subcutaneously once daily, in addition to lifestyle therapy. Liraglutide was superior to placebo with regard to the change from baseline in the BMI standard deviation score at week 56, with an estimated treatment difference of minus 0.22. A reduction in BMI of at least 5% was observed in 43.3% of participants in the liraglutide group and in 18.7% of participants in the placebo group. And a reduction in BMI of at least 10% was observed in 26.1% and 8.1% respectively. A greater reduction was observed with liraglutide than with placebo for BMI, estimated difference minus 4.64 percentage points, and for body weight, estimated difference minus 4.5 kilograms for absolute change and minus 5.01 percentage points for relative change. After discontinuation, a greater increase in the BMI standard deviation score was observed with liraglutide, estimated difference 0.15. More participants in the liraglutide group had gastrointestinal adverse events, 64.8% versus 36.5%. Few participants in either group had serious adverse events, 2.4% versus 4%. One suicide, which occurred in the liraglutide group, was assessed by the investigator as unlikely to be related to the trial treatment. In adolescents with obesity, the use of liraglutide plus lifestyle therapy led to a significantly greater reduction in the BMI standard deviation score than placebo plus lifestyle therapy. FDA Initiative for Drug Facts Label for Over-the-Counter Naloxone by Barbara Cohen 
from the Food and Drug Administration, Silver Spring, Maryland. The opioid crisis highlights the need to increase access to naloxone, possibly through regulatory approval or over-the-counter sales. To address industry-perceived barriers to such access, the FDA developed a model drug facts label for such sales to assess whether consumers understood the key statements for safe and effective use. This study involved structured interviews with 710 adults and adolescents, including many who use opioids and their family and friends. Eight primary endpoints were developed to assess user comprehension of each of the key steps in the label. The results for performance on six primary endpoints met or exceeded thresholds, including the steps check for a suspected overdose, threshold 85%, point estimate PE 95.8%, and give the first dose, threshold 85%, PE 98.2%. The lower boundaries for four other primary endpoints ranged from 88.8 to 94%. One exception was comprehension of call 911 immediately, but this instruction closely approximated the target of 90%, PE 90.3%. Another exception was comprehension of the composite step of check, give, and call 911 immediately, threshold 85%, PE 81.1%. Overall, the FDA found that the model label was adequate for use in the development of a naloxone product intended for over-the-counter sales. Acute on Chronic Liver Failure, a review article by Vincente Arroyo from the European Foundation for the Study of Chronic Liver Failure, Barcelona, Spain. Acutely decompensated cirrhosis and acute on chronic liver failure are two important conditions observed in patients with known chronic liver disease who have acute decompensation. Acutely decompensated cirrhosis, which is a widely accepted condition, refers to the development of ascites, encephalopathy, gastrointestinal hemorrhage, or any combination of these disorders in patients with cirrhosis. Acute on chronic liver failure emerged from studies showing the development of a syndrome associated with a high risk of short-term death, that is, death within 28 days after hospital admission, in patients with acutely decompensated cirrhosis. Three major features characterize this syndrome. It occurs in the context of intense systemic inflammation, frequently develops in close temporal relationship with pro-inflammatory precipitating events, such as infections or alcoholic hepatitis, and is associated with single or multiple organ failure. Although a substantial body of literature recognizes acute on chronic liver failure as a clinical entity, that is currently eight registered randomized therapeutic trials are recruiting patients with acute on chronic liver failure, some people doubt the existence of the syndrome. Moreover, proposed definitions of acute on chronic liver failure differ from one another. This review examines evidence to support the concept of acute on chronic liver failure and highlights areas that are controversial. A 68-year-old man with COVID-19 and acute kidney injury. A case record of the Massachusetts General Hospital by Megan Size and colleagues. A 68-year-old man was admitted to the hospital with fever, shortness of breath, and acute kidney injury. Four days earlier, fever developed and associated shaking chills. The following day, he stopped using long-acting insulin for his diabetes because fasting blood glucose levels were less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. One day before admission, a dry cough developed. On the morning of admission, the patient noticed shortness of breath. He called his primary care physician, who recommended that he present to the emergency department for further evaluation. He had no known contact with anyone with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. A chest x-ray showed bilateral multifocal patchy opacities, a finding suggestive of pneumonia. The patient was admitted to the hospital. Testing of a nasopharyngeal swab for SARS-CoV-2 RNA was positive. Treatment with hydroxychloroquine was started, and the patient was enrolled in a placebo-controlled clinical trial of remdesivir. Respiratory failure and hypotension developed. The creatinine level was 6.9 milligrams per deciliter, and the urea nitrogen level 111 milligrams per deciliter. The patient's participation in the clinical trial of remdesivir was discontinued. Acute kidney injury, ranging from pre-renal azotemia to acute tubular necrosis, may develop in patients with COVID-19 because of poor oral intake, sepsis, and cytokine storm. However, reports from Wuhan, China, have shown high incidences of proteinuria and hematuria by dipstick testing, findings that were seen in this patient. Because angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2, a putative receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is expressed in kidneys in humans, the kidneys may be a direct target of the virus. The development of acute kidney injury in this patient with COVID-19 required specific management considerations. Harnessing our humanity. 
how Washington's healthcare workers have risen to the pandemic challenge. A perspective article by Lisa Rosenbaum, a national correspondent for The Journal. In early March, Ms. B, a woman in her mid-70s, was admitted from her nursing home to Seattle Harborview's medical ICU with suspected COVID-19. When she rapidly decompensated, the ICU team resuscitated her as they would any patient. Central line, fluids, pressors. But when it became clear that her death was imminent, providing supportive yeah, end-of-life care proved more difficult. Because Ms. B had been quarantined in the nursing home for several days, her family was already quite distressed about not being able to see her. And the hospital's strict visitor policy meant that even if they could get there quickly enough, their time at her bedside, if they were allowed any at all, would be severely limited. For Courtney Enix, a senior resident who cared for Ms. B and other patients with COVID-19 during her recent ICU rotation, Ms. B's clinical course exposed the difficulty of maintaining standards of care amid the pandemic's constraints. And the hospital, recognizing the resulting moral distress, began involving the palliative care service as soon as a critically ill patient with COVID-19 was admitted. But determining how best to care for patients at the end of life is just one of countless challenges Seattle area healthcare workers faced as they bore the initial brunt of the US epidemic. But as the pandemic continues to spread, and resource constraints compromise us, Seattle's response to COVID-19 reminds us that the professional spirit marches on, unconstrained. Sharing health data and biospecimens with industry, a principle-driven practical approach, a perspective article by Kate Spector Baghdadi from Michigan Medicine, Ann Arbor. The advent of standardized electronic health records, sustainable biobanks, consumer wellness applications, and advanced diagnostics has resulted in new health information repositories. As highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, these repositories create an opportunity for advancing health research by means of secondary use of data and biospecimens. Current regulations in this space give substantial discretion to individual organizations when it comes to sharing de-identified data and specimens. But some recent examples of healthcare institutions sharing individual level data and specimens with companies have generated controversy. Academic medical centers are therefore both practically and ethically compelled to establish best practices for governing the sharing of such contributions with outside entities. The federal policy for the protection of human subjects offers some safeguards for research participants from whom data and specimens have been collected. These regulations generally cover only federally funded work, however, and they don't apply to de-identified data or specimens. Using a principalist approach that balances beneficence and non-maleficence, respect for persons, and justice, buttressed by recent analyses and findings regarding contributors' preferences, Michigan Medicine established a formal process to guide their approach. Their approach could help inform the national conversation on this issue. Flattening the curve for incarcerated populations, COVID-19 in jails and prisons, a perspective article by Matthew Akiyama from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Bronx, New York. Because of policies of mass incarceration over the past four decades, the United States has incarcerated more people than any other country on earth. As of the end of 2016, there were nearly 2.2 million people in US prisons and jails. People entering jails are among the most vulnerable in our society, and during incarceration, that vulnerability is exacerbated by restricted movement, confined spaces, and limited medical care. People caught up in the U.S. justice system have already been affected by SARS-CoV-2, and improved preparation is essential to minimizing the impact of this pandemic on incarcerated persons, correctional staff, and surrounding communities. To operationalize a response for incarcerated populations, three levels of preparedness need to be addressed. The virus should be delayed as much as possible from entering correctional settings. If it is already in circulation, it should be controlled, and jails and prisons should prepare to deal with a high burden of disease. The better the mitigation job done by legal, public health, and correctional health partnerships, the lighter the burden correctional facilities and their surrounding communities will bear. Therefore, these authors believe that efforts to decarcerate, which are already underway in some jurisdictions, need to be scaled up, and associated reductions of incarcerated populations should be sustained. Blood Ties, a perspective article by Eliana Hempel from Penn State Health, Hershey, Pennsylvania. The expansive window of the ICU room looks out over a gorgeous Sunday sunset. Monitors beat reassuringly. Dr. Hempel has known him a long time. 
but the disheveled man before her with the hunted look in his eyes seems unfamiliar. His handkerchief makes repeated trips from his mouth to his lap, and each time his look of horror at the increasing amount of bright red blood intensifies. He can barely breathe, let alone talk, and the metallic smell of blood mingles with the smell of raw fear. The screen behind Dr. Hempel suddenly starts to glow, and a face appears. The tele-ICU physician. Backup. Thank goodness. Maybe he'll have some ideas. Dr. Hempel springs into calm doctor mode. This is just like any other time, but not really. He's 61 years old, she begins. He has been otherwise fairly healthy, but was diagnosed with squamous cell carcinoma of the left base of the tongue eight months ago. He progressed through multiple treatments and completed a course of palliative radiation about one week ago. He started spitting out bright red blood earlier today. Initially, the bleeding stopped, but it started again 30 minutes ago. It is now worse in severity, with copious clots. He is not on any blood thinners. I am concerned about his ability to protect his airway. The tele-ICU physician asks the nurses to stat page the otolaryngologist on call. The situation continues to deteriorate. The bleeding is worsening. Bags and bags of blood and saline are rapidly infusing into the patient's port. The trauma surgery team runs in. Our images in clinical medicine features a 69-year-old man with type 2 diabetes mellitus who presented to the ophthalmology clinic for routine ocular examination. Three years earlier, he had undergone cataract surgery and vitrectomy of the right eye for a retinal detachment. Clinical examination of the right eye showed a white substance covering the upper third of the iris. Visual acuity was 20 over 400 in the right eye and 20 over 40 in the left eye. Slit lamp examination of the right eye revealed mild corneal edema, as well as a layer of emulsified silicone oil in the superior anterior chamber, known as a hyperoleon that moved slightly with tilting of the head. Pigmentary deposits covered the intraocular lens. The intraocular pressure was normal. The long-term use of silicone oil as an endotamponade in ocular surgery can result in complications associated with its emulsification and prolapse through anatomically compromised areas. The density of silicone oil is lower than that of aqueous humor and therefore it settles at the top of the anterior chamber. The silicone oil was surgically removed and the patient's visual acuity improved to 20 over 80 in the right eye. There was no recurrence of retinal detachment at a follow-up visit six months later. A 25-year-old man presented to the otolaryngology clinic with hypernasal speech and regurgitation of food into the nasal cavity that had been present since childhood. He had no history of recurrent ear infections or delays in growth or language development. Physical examination revealed a bifid uvula and a submucosal defect along the midline of the hard palate that were consistent with a submucosal cleft palate. Nasopharyngoscopy revealed incomplete closure of the velopharyngeal valve. There was no notching on palpation of the posterior hard palate, and there were no other craniofacial abnormalities. Submucosal cleft palate is typically caused by an incomplete fusion of the palatine shelves with the nasal septum at the level of the hard palate and the abnormal attachment of palatal muscles in the soft palate to the posterior edge of the hard palate. The patient declined surgical treatment and was referred for speech and language therapy. This concludes our summary. Let us know what you think about our audio summaries. Any comments or suggestions may be sent to audio at nejm.org. Thank you for listening. Welcome. This is the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Dr. Lisa Johnson. This week, June 4, 2020, we feature articles on relugalix for androgen deprivation therapy, enzalutamide in prostate cancer, rituximab and chemotherapy in pediatric high-grade lymphoma, handgun ownership and suicide in California, and dynamic developments in screening candidate drugs. Review articles on bed bugs and on the cardiovascular consequences of acute kidney injury, a clinical problem solving on the game is the foot, and perspective articles on lower prices and greater patient access on specialty drugs, on ensuring and sustaining a pandemic workforce, and on waiting. Oral relugalix for androgen deprivation therapy in advanced prostate cancer by Neil Shore from the Carolina Urologic Research Center, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Injectable luteinizing hormone releasing hormone agonists, such as luprolide, are the standard agents for achieving androgen deprivation for prostate cancer, despite the initial testosterone surge and delay in therapeutic effect. In this phase three trial, 
patients with advanced prostate cancer were randomly assigned to receive the oral gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist Relugolix, 622 patients, or Lucrolide, 308 patients, for 48 weeks. Of men who received Relugolix, 96.7% maintained castration through 48 weeks, as compared with 88.8% of men receiving Lucrolide. The difference of 7.9 percentage points showed non-inferiority and superiority of Relugolix. All other key secondary endpoints showed superiority of Relugolix over Lucrolide. The percentage of patients with castrate levels of testosterone on day 4 was 56% with Relugolix and 0% with Lucrolide. High response rates in the Relugolix group were observed across the subgroups analyzed. Among all the patients, the incidence of major adverse cardiovascular events was 2.9% in the Relugolix group and 6.2% in the Lucrolide group. In this trial involving men with advanced prostate cancer, Relugolix achieved rapid sustained suppression of testosterone levels that was superior to that with Lucrolide, with a 54% lower risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. Enzalutamide and Survival in Non-Metastatic Castration-Resistant Prostate Cancer by Cora Sternberg from Wild Cornell Medicine, New York. Preliminary trial results showed that enzalutamide, an oral androgen receptor inhibitor, significantly improved metastasis-free survival among men who had non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and rapidly increasing prostate-specific antigen, PSA, levels while taking androgen deprivation therapy. Results from the final analysis of overall survival are now reported. Patients who were continuing to receive androgen deprivation therapy were randomly assigned to receive enzalutamide or placebo once daily. As of October 15, 2019, 31% of 933 patients in the enzalutamide group and 38% of 468 patients in the placebo group had died. Median overall survival was 67 months in the enzalutamide group and 56.3 months in the placebo group. The exposure adjusted rate of adverse events of grade three or higher was 17 per 100 patient years in the enzalutamide group and 20 per 100 patient years in the placebo group. The most frequently reported adverse events were fatigue and musculoskeletal events. Enzalutamide plus androgen deprivation therapy resulted in longer median overall survival than placebo plus androgen deprivation therapy among men with non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and a rapidly rising PSA level. The risk of death associated with enzalutamide was 27% lower than with placebo. Adverse events were consistent with the established safety profile of enzalutamide. Celestia Higano from the University of Washington, Seattle, writes in an editorial that men with prostate cancer have a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease than those without. And among men with prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease is the principal non-cancer-related cause of death. Androgen deprivation monotherapy with a GnRH agonist and the addition of the newer second-generation androgen signaling blockers 2-ABT were found in these trials to be associated with an increase in cardiovascular events in men with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. When considered together, these trials raise the question of whether the use of a GnRH antagonist, either oral or subcutaneous, might result in improved cardiovascular outcomes, especially for those at highest risk. To that end, it might be time to consider treating men who have pre-existing cardiovascular risk factors with a GnRH antagonist rather than an agonist. Even though no level 1 outcome data exist for the superiority of a GnRH antagonist over a GnRH agonist with respect to cardiovascular events or death from cardiovascular causes, the testosterone suppression data for GnRH antagonists, oral or subcutaneous, are level 1. Therefore, it is likely that the anti-cancer effects of a GnRH antagonist will not be inferior to those of a GnRH agonist and may be beneficial in terms of cardiovascular events that may be life-limiting. Close monitoring will be required because exposure to oral relugolix for longer than 48 weeks has not been studied, and many oral agents are associated with adherence problems, especially if they cause adverse effects.
rituximab for high-risk mature B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in children by Véronique Minard-Colin from Gustave Roussy, Université Paris-Saclay, Vigeuif, France. Rituximab added to chemotherapy prolongs survival among adults with B-cell cancer. Data on its efficacy and safety in children with high-grade mature B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are limited. In this randomized international phase 3 trial, the investigators found that among 328 children and adolescents with high-grade, high-risk, mature B-cell lymphoma, the addition of six doses of rituximab to standard lymphomes Malins B LNB chemotherapy led to significantly better event-free survival outcomes. Hazard ratio for an event, 0.32. Three-year event-free survival, 93.9% in the rituximab chemotherapy group versus 82.3% in the chemotherapy group. The benefit was similar across the various therapeutic groups, including the group of patients with central nervous system disease. Higher three-year overall survival was also observed, 95.1% in the rituximab chemotherapy group versus 87.3% in the chemotherapy group. Overall, the acute toxic effects that were associated with the addition of rituximab mainly involved a higher incidence of myelotoxic effects. But further follow-up is needed to provide information on long-term safety because rituximab therapy induced more hypogammaglobulinemia than chemotherapy alone. Handgun Ownership and Suicide in California by David Studdard from the Stanford Law School, California. Research has consistently identified firearm availability as a risk factor for suicide. However, existing studies are relatively small in scale, estimates vary widely, and no study appears to have tracked risks from commencement of firearm ownership. These investigators tracked firearm ownership and mortality over 12.2 years in a cohort of 26.3 million adult residents of California. A total of 676,425 cohort members acquired one or more handguns, and 1,457,981 died. 17,894 died by suicide, of which 6,691 were suicides by firearm. Rates of suicide by any method were higher among handgun owners, with an adjusted hazard ratio of 3.34 for all male owners as compared with male non-owners, and 7.16 for female owners as compared with female non-owners. These rates were driven by much higher rates of suicide by firearm among both male and female handgun owners, with a hazard ratio of 7.82 for men and 35.15 for women. Handgun owners did not have higher rates of suicide by other methods or higher all-cause mortality. The risk of suicide by firearm among handgun owners peaked immediately after the first acquisition, but 52% of all suicides by firearm among handgun owners occurred more than one year after acquisition. Handgun ownership is associated with a greatly elevated and enduring risk of suicide by firearm. In an editorial, Hannah Sachs from Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston, writes that in March, as the coronavirus pandemic spread throughout the United States, Americans bought nearly 2 million guns, the second highest monthly total in the decades since such records have been kept. Previous spikes in U.S. firearm sales have followed widely publicized mass shootings and the attendant national calls for regulation regarding the prevention of gun violence. Gun violence in America is often mired in intense political or legal debate, but the article by Studdard and colleagues serves as yet another reminder that gun violence is unequivocally a public health issue. Two particularly important findings emerge from this rigorously conducted study. First, new handgun ownership is strongly associated with suicide immediately following California's 10-day waiting period between purchase and acquisition of a firearm. Second, although the absolute risk of suicide is higher among men than among women, new handgun ownership is associated with a disproportionately greater increase in death by suicide among women. The study provides critical new insights into new handgun ownership as a risk factor for suicide, but it is limited in its focus on the gun owner, probably underestimating the risk for other household members. The study may also underestimate rates of suicide by firearm in states that do not have a mandatory waiting period, have less stringent gun-related regulations, and have higher baseline rates of death by firearm than California. 
Addressing these and other potential limitations of the study will require further rigorously conducted research. How will the current surge of gun purchases affect firearm-related violence, with an additional 2 million guns now in households across the country at a time of widespread unemployment, social isolation, and acute national stress that is unprecedented in our lifetime? We urgently need to find out. Bedbugs, a clinical practice article by Philippe Carola from the Institut Hospital Universitaire Méditerranée Infection. Marseille, France. <coughs> Bed bugs are flat, brown insects that bite humans to obtain a blood meal. Between blood meals, bed bugs hide in dark places, such as household cracks and crevices, walls, luggage, bed clothes, mattresses, bed springs, bed frames, spaces under baseboards, loose or peeling wallpaper, electrical switch plates, and conduits for electrical cables. They emerge from these hiding places primarily at night to feed on their sleeping human hosts. The introduction of several bed bugs into a new site leads to their exponential multiplication with thousands of bugs after two or three months. Bed bug infestations have increased dramatically in recent years and are associated with substantial economic costs and psychological distress. Infestations are often recognized when patients present for medical care for skin lesions. Suggestive skin lesions should prompt advice to investigate the home for evidence of bed bugs, which may require professional assistance. Mechanical methods, including vacuuming and heating or freezing, are essential to eradicate bed bugs. Although commercial insecticides are frequently used, these are of limited effectiveness because of resistance. In settings where insecticides are used, they should be combined with mechanical methods. To date, bed bugs have not been implicated in transmission of infectious agents to humans. Cardiovascular Consequences of Acute Kidney Injury, a review article by Matthew Legrand from the University of California, San Francisco. Acute kidney injury is generally characterized by an abrupt rise in the serum creatinine level, decreased urinary output, or both. Advances in critical care and renal replacement therapies have provided tools that can support patients through most of the immediate complications of acute kidney injury, such as uremia or hyperkalemia, which could be rapidly fatal. Yet mortality from acute kidney injury remains high. Up to 60% of patients with severe acute kidney injury who are admitted to an ICU die from the disorder. The long-term risk of death associated with acute kidney injury is also increased. Chronic hypertension and heart failure are risk factors for acute kidney injury and can hamper recovery from kidney injury. Conversely, acute kidney injury is associated with an increased risk of death and both short-term and long-term cardiovascular complications, such as decompensated heart failure. The therapeutic use of blockers of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system may be associated with improved outcomes in patients recovering from acute kidney injury, but interventional trials are needed to refine strategies for treating patients after an acute episode. This review discusses the current understanding of the cardiovascular consequences of acute kidney injury and potential preventive strategies that target acute and recovery phases with the aim of reducing the risk of subsequent adverse clinical events. The game is afoot. A clinical problem-solving article by Nicholas Yozan from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston. A 63-year-old woman presented with several months of pain in both ankles. Two years earlier, she had fallen and fractured the left tibial plateau. The fracture-related pain in her left knee initially lessened with physical therapy, but worsening pain subsequently developed in that knee, and she was found to have a new fracture of the left medial femoral condyle. Pain lessened again with conservative therapy. Progressive pain then developed in both ankles. She reported no fever, weight loss, or pain elsewhere. Plain x-rays at the ankles did not show fractures. However, laboratory studies showed an elevated alkaline phosphatase level, which was presumably a consequence of increased bone turnover. Radionuclide bone scanning showed several new insufficiency fractures in the ankles, including of the left and right distal tibias, the left distal fibula, and the right calcaneus. The bone scan also showed insufficiency fractures of the ribs, vertebrae, proximal tibias, and distal femurs. The observed fractures in the tibias, fibula, and calcaneus explained the patient's ankle pain, but the radiographic findings were much more diffuse. 
The most likely diagnosis in this patient was osteomalacia, a disorder of bone mineralization that leads to fractures and bone pain. There was no clear nutritional cause for the patient's presumed osteomalacia, given a sufficient 25-hydroxy vitamin D level. The hypocalcemia was also relatively mild. An acquired or hereditary hypophosphatemic disorder was suspected as the cause of her osteomalacia. How to discover antiviral drugs quickly. A clinical implications of basic research article by Jerry Parks from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Tennessee. We urgently need effective drugs for COVID-19, but what is the quickest way to find them? One approach that sometimes seems akin to a Hail Mary pass in American football is to hope that drugs that have worked against a different virus, such as hepatitis C or Ebola, will also work against COVID-19. Alternatively, we can be rational and specifically target proteins of SARS-CoV-2 so as to interrupt its life cycle. The SARS-CoV-2 genome encodes approximately 25 proteins that are needed by the virus to infect humans and to replicate. Finding drugs that can bind to the viral proteins and stop them from working is a logical way forward and the priority of many research laboratories. One approach toward this goal involves mimicking nature with the use of computational structure-based drug discovery. Molecular dynamic simulations together with virtual high throughput screening provide a means of quick evaluation of existing drugs for antiviral activity. The authors explain how these methods serve in the quest for drugs to treat COVID-19. Lower prices and greater patient access. Lessons from Germany's drug purchasing structure. A perspective article by James Robinson from the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. Drug prices are lower in Germany than in the United States, despite similarities between the two countries in terms of average household income, reliance on private in addition to public health insurance plans, and cultural preferences for negotiation over regulation. The experience of Germany and other countries has traditionally been dismissed as politically irrelevant to the United States, but this sentiment has changed over the past year as drug pricing has become a salient theme in the 2020 presidential election. President Trump has contributed heavily to this shift with his proposals to align U.S. prices with those in other countries. The Senate Finance Committee has developed bipartisan legislation that would sharply limit a manufacturer's ability to raise a drug's price after its initial market launch. And the House of Representatives has passed legislation establishing a structure for Medicare to negotiate prices with manufacturers. These proposals share important features with each other and with the German structure for determining drug prices. Important features of the German system include limits on post-launch price increases and rules prohibiting insurers from imposing prior authorization requirements and other access barriers on patients. Specialty drugs, a distinctly American phenomenon. A perspective article by Hussein Naji from the London School of Economics and Political Science. According to a report by the Congressional Budget Office, roughly 1% of prescription drugs dispensed under Medicare Part D and Medicaid accounted for about 30% of net drug spending in each program in 2015. The agency found that between 2010 and 2015, net spending on these so-called specialty drugs rose from $8.7 billion to $32.8 billion in Medicare Part D and from $4.8 billion to $9.9 billion in Medicaid. Similarly, spending on specialty drugs by commercial plans nearly quadrupled between 2003 and 2014. The origins of the specialty drug label can be traced back to the 1970s, when specialty pharmacies emerged in response to the need for preparation and delivery of new injectable and infusion products. Only a handful of drugs required such handling at the time and were called specialty drugs. Today, various stakeholders in the pharmaceutical supply chain assign the specialty label to drugs on the basis of a combination of several unrelated factors, such as whether a drug treats a rare condition, requires special handling, or needs post-marketing risk management plans. But the single most common feature of specialty drugs is high cost. Labeling all expensive drugs as specialty drugs and placing them on the highest cost-sharing tiers in planned formularies is an approach taken only by the U.S. healthcare system. 
Other high-income countries undertake value-based assessments to determine whether a drug's cost is justified given its benefits. Effective article by Aaron Freyer from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Efforts to fight the COVID-19 pandemic have aimed to slow viral spread and increase testing, protect healthcare workers from infection, and obtain ventilators and other equipment to prepare for a surge of critically ill patients. But additional actions have been needed to rapidly increase health workforce capacity and to replenish it when personnel are quarantined or need time off to rest or care for sick family members. It has seemed clear that healthcare delivery organizations, educators, and government leaders will all have to be willing to cut through bureaucratic barriers and adapt regulations to rapidly expand the U.S. healthcare workforce and sustain it for the duration of the pandemic. Some of the actions discussed in this article are temporary, whereas others, such as expanding scopes of practice, cross-state licensure, and allowing greater use of telehealth services, probably make sense in general, but are especially critical now. How well the country handles the COVID-19 crisis depends largely on how effectively our health workforce is used. Much can be done to ensure that the workforce is prepared to defeat the pandemic. Once the pandemic has subsided, workforce changes should be evaluated, and the results used to inform wiser use of the workforce and improve responses to future pandemics. Waiting, a perspective article by Elizabeth Rourke from Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston. In January, reported events in China seemed remote. Dr. Rourke encountered snippets, hospitals overwhelmed, truth tellers silenced, a stunning state response, a city of 11 million still, all transportation shut down, enormous structures built to confine anyone with a fever. So far away. One patient arrived in her town, a student from Wuhan returning to school. Immediately, a textbook public health response, so reassuring. The student never even felt that sick. In February, more spread to countries seemingly selected at random. Dr. Wark's life went on as usual, patients in clinic, errands, gathering with friends. She took a trip for the February school vacation. She bought a king cake and celebrated Mardi Gras. At the end of the month, questions arose. Should they stock up on food? She bought some giant tins of tuna, feeling stupid. On March 13, everything changed. Her children's school abruptly closed. Half her clinic slots were empty, and she realized what was happening in Italy. She started doing sixth grade math, number of people in the United States times the percentage who might be infected times the percentage who will need a hospital bed times the percentage who will need a respirator times the percentage who will die. The numbers she got were insane. When she wasn't working, she felt agitated. When she looked at the mortality curves for Italy, France, and other places, she could pinpoint precisely where her town was sitting. But her brain rabbited around trying to unknow what the graph showed. What if our social distancing would help? What if we flattened the curve even a little bit? Our images in clinical medicine features a five-year-old boy who presented to the dermatology clinic with a two-week history of painless blisters localized to the scrotum. He was otherwise healthy and not using any medications. Physical examination showed multiple painless and tense bullae containing clear to slightly hemorrhagic fluid on the scrotum. There were no mucosal abnormalities or blisters seen elsewhere. A biopsy specimen of one of the lesions was obtained, and histopathological testing revealed sub-epidermal blisters that contained eosinophilic and neutrophilic infiltrates. Direct immunofluorescence antibody staining of a perilesional area showed a linear band of IgA deposition along the dermoepidermal junction, a finding that confirmed the diagnosis of linear IgA bullous dermatosis. This autoimmune blistering disease can occur in children and adults. The perioral and perineal areas may be more commonly affected in children than in adults. With high-potency topical glucocorticoid treatment, the patient's lesions healed within two weeks with no recurrence. A 50-year-old woman with a history of bicable cardiac transplantation presented to the emergency department with a one-week history of dyspnea, fatigue, and weight gain. A transthoracic echocardiogram showed newly reduced left ventricular systolic function and an endomyocardial biopsy confirmed acute cellular rejection of the transplanted heart. Her hemodynamic status deteriorated, thereby prompting initiation of veno-arterial extracorporeal membrane.
atrial valve opening indicated atrioventricular dissociation during ventricular fibrillation. Premature closure of the atrioventricular valves immediately after atrial contraction was also observed. The patient had worsening multi-organ failure and died one week after presentation. This concludes our summary. Let us know what you think about our audio summaries. Any comments or suggestions may be sent to audio at NEJM.org. Thank you for listening. suspected I was incontinent. Uh, incontinent, <laughs> I only found out later that these were smelling tests. 
and that this fabric was put into a glass jar for sniffer dogs. <laughs> this is Ulrike Pavo. She was a famous dissident in East Germany in the 70s and 80s. And the reason I wanted to talk to her was that even by the Stasi's standards of surveillance, she was special. From 1978 until 1989, Ulrike was one of the most surveilled people in East German history. For starters, she says that basically she was followed every second of every day she spent outside the house. Sometimes they tried to hide, other times they were very obvious, one and a half meters behind us, three, four young people, young men, and somehow they had these gray faces, you could see it, and the way these guys looked at the wall when you passed them on the stairs, they could only be Stasi. What do you mean they looked away? They avoided eye contact? Yeah, yeah. Yes, they would look away, and they didn't greet anyone. And my little daughter always wanted to play with them. You know. <laughs> but they were just standing there, their arms hanging down. The arms hanging down. Well, Rika says that she sometimes tried to dodge her Stasi miners by riding around on a bike and taking back alleys. But then the Stasi just got their own bikes and rode after her. Then a friend made me a map of all the backyards and the paths through them. You could enter a house, climb over the rubbish bins, and leave through another house on a totally different street. But apparently, the Stasi also had such a map. Anyway, they always managed to catch me again somehow. And of course, Ulrike's surveillance didn't stop at her front door. From the late 70s onward, she and her husband knew that their apartment was bugged. Whispering was futile, but background noise was good. You could really drown things out with background noise. But later I discovered that they also had filmed into our windows. Now, you might think that to merit this kind of attention from the Stasi, Ulrike was some kind of super spy, or a resistance fighter, hiding out in safe houses, sabotage and rail lines. But really, no. Ulrike's forms of resistance were actually pretty tame. She and her husband founded a dissident group called the Initiative for Peace and Human Rights. Their members hosted readings of banned books, distributed pamphlets calling for free elections, and organized protest marches. So why all the surveillance? Why didn't the Stasi just lock her up and throw away the key? Well, the problem, at least for the Stasi, was that Ulrike's dissident activities made her a little too famous, especially in the West. And East Germany didn't want the bad press. They wanted to seem like benevolent socialists, not a ruthless authoritarian regime. So, sure, they could occasionally arrest Ulrike, interrogate her, and do things like collect her smells. But in the end, they always had to let her go. So, when she wasn't stirring up trouble, Ulrike's life was, at least on the surface, pretty normal. I came from a good home and worked for the Museum of German History. It was not a good feeling to not have any private space. All we could do was to try to carry on with life as though no one was listening. And I thought I had managed to cope with this quite well. But now I'm not so sure. Ulrike explained that it was this psychological pressure, more than anything, that was the real reason for the surveillance. The Stasi always knew that it would be hard to lock her up, so instead, they were trying to essentially gaslight Ulrike and her friends, until they lost confidence and gave up. They were trying to drive her crazy, literally. So there was a whole load of small problems in our life, and they were actually formally known as measures to spread uncertainty and insecurity. You can look it up on the internet. Measures to spread uncertainty and insecurity? Yeah. Yes. For example, I'd come out of the shopping hall with my two kids and all my shopping bags and would sit the kids on the bike and then find that my tires are flat. Of course, if it had happened just once, you would think that you'd ridden over a piece of glass or that someone had played a prank on you. But because it happened so often, I began to suspect it was a Stasi strategy to unsettle us. But Ulrike didn't dare talk about that stuff with anyone because she remembered what had happened to her friend Karen. Karin? Karen was a doctor, a pediatrician. She was extremely tidy, and she told us that someone had been in her and had switched the towels up. She always put the red towel to the right and the white one to the left. But when she got home, the white was on the right and the red on the left. But Karen was a sensitive person, so everyone thought she was just being paranoid. Was macht die Stasi? Why would the Stasi go into people's flats to switch around their towels? So warum sollte sie das machen? It would be too stupid. But actually, it was part of their plan. They knew she was psychologically unstable. 
and they also realized that if Karin went around talking about things like that, she would become less credible. And eventually, she was unable to work. And she is still at that point. And it broke her. So when the Stasi kept puncturing Ulrika's tires, she was careful not to talk about it too much. In case people said that I was paranoid, because of course we didn't have any proof. And even if she did have someone to tell, a friend perhaps, there was always the problem that that friend might be an informer, someone who had been planted or turned by the Stasi to spy on her. For example, with a colleague of mine, who can't be sure. I just couldn't be certain. But sometimes I'd have this inkling. In what way? <laughs> His apartment looked different, was decorated differently. So it's been it was as though someone else, someone from the Stasi, had decorated his apartment for him. There was just no individuality, nothing. Anyway, I was very anxious. Ulrika's life was like a play being watched by the Stasi, staged by the Stasi, even cast by the Stasi. What was real? Who was real? It was these lingering suspicions and the not knowing more than anything that drove her crazy. She didn't even know who was in charge of her case. She never met them. What she did know was that somewhere inside the Stasi headquarters was a file with her name on it that had the answers. And sometimes she fantasized about absurd and dangerous things. I'd been dreaming about having the opportunity to view my file for a long time. I wondered whether I might be able to find a rogue state security agent whom I could maybe meet with and who would be able to bring it to me. I was really curious about what it would contain, what the Stasi's plans were, how much they had heard, but also to what extent events had been manipulated by them and to what extent I had been able to direct my own life. And this would have been Ulrika's life, trying to act normal while being constantly watched and wondering the whole time about what was real and what was fake, forever. But then, after almost a decade of round-the-clock surveillance, something happened that would turn everything upside down. A uh, prospect that uh, no one could have predicted a year ago or even a month ago. This has been a city physically divided for 28 years. Our top story. The Iron Curtain between East Germany and West Berlin has come tumbling down. East Germany announced today it is opening its borders, allowing its citizens to go anywhere they wish. The devices disconnected. The tape recorder stopped. Their entire surveillance state disappeared overnight. And as for Ulrika, who had dreamt of getting to see her Stasi file, she was about to get a wish. I can remember that day very well. I was full of anticipation. Now, finally, all this secret knowledge was going to be brought into the light of day. In the winter of 1992, at the invitation of a special government commission, Ulrike and her husband, along with a few other dissidents who had been under particularly extensive surveillance, all walked together into an austere gray building. And then they were ushered into this big room and sat down at a little table in a long line of tables. And that's when the staff walked in with the files. Und wir konnten durchaus damit and obviously we assumed that all of this surveillance would be formally recorded and filed somewhere. But still we were strangely taken aback when an entire cart was pushed up to our table. Not a file, not a box, an entire cart with boxes with the files. Mit solch einer Fülle von I hadn't anticipated such a huge volume of material. Ich hatte eigentlich keine Vorstellung. I couldn't really imagine it. Trolleys full of files. When we told you that Ulrike was one of the most surveilled people in East Germany, she didn't actually know that until now. When she opened the folders, it seemed as if the Stasi must have recorded everything she had ever done, almost down to the minute, where she was, what she said, what she ate for lunch that day. They even had recorded what time the light went out in the evening and what time we got up in the morning. So then my husband and me began to leaf feverishly through these mountains of folders and we read and read and read. Back in her apartment, all these years later, Ulrika takes down a carefully labeled three-inch binder from her shelf. It's one of over 60 she's been sent over the years. So this is the Kurzfassung. So this is, so to speak, a summary of my life. And if I want to know, for example, what happened on October 15th, 1986, I can look in here. But the thing Ulrika really cares about is not what's written in the reports, but who wrote them. 
Because remember, for years she had never been sure which of her friends had been informants, basically ratting her out and passing their private conversations on to the Stasi. When she opened her file, she got to find out who had been a true friend and who had betrayed her. Franz, here's a report by the informant Franz about a party we attended from the 31st of August 1988. There's one to three reports on that one party alone. And who are the witnesses reported here? The, uh, under That's everyone else who attended. I'll show you now how many of them were informants. Not Grimm, not Böttcher, not Weissel. Böhme was Böhme was an informant. Harz was an informant. Wetzky was an informant. Pavlicak was an informant. Dietrich was an informant. So out of 13, five were informants. So almost half. Oh, here's another one mentioned, Wolf. He was also an informant. So six informants in total. Also das war die Initiative. So that was in the most radical opposition. And it was infiltrated by a huge number of informants. So ungefähr, also insgesamt, also about, all in all, over 80 informants in these files. In all the files. That's 80 separate people. Eight, zero, who were informing on Ulrike. She says that in the case of people who were clearly coerced into becoming informants, she's happy to forgive them and move on. But then there are other reports which emit denunciatory zeal, which are nasty and mean-spirited, where you suspect a pleasure in causing harm. So some I can accept and continue to maintain some level of contact, but with others, I'm just not interested anymore. What about the informant who wrote this report we're reading? Franz? His code name was Franz, and I read several reports by him on that first day in the archives. And it was clear that I had had a close relationship with this person. But who could he be? Well, eventually, I found a report which allowed me to conclusively identify him. And I called him while I was still in the archives and expressed my horror. I said, how could you? Why didn't you speak to me about this, especially because you had two years to tell me? Why am I discovering this from the files? Why? And he hummed and hawed and said that, yes, we should speak about it and so on. And that evening I called him, but no one picked up the phone. I asked a friend to go around to check on him. And then this friend called me and said, the car is parked outside, but no one is answering the door. So then my friend and I had a terrible suspicion, and she got someone to break down the door. He was found inside, unconscious, but still alive. He had tried to poison himself. Sadly, what happened to Franz was pretty common at that time. The opening of the Stasi archives caused a huge amount of anxiety among East Germans. A lot of people who had been pressured into being informants, thinking no one would ever know, were suddenly about to be unmasked. Some committed suicide before the files were even opened. It got to the point where some started to wonder whether the files should be destroyed instead and never read at all. Maybe it was better to leave the past in the past and let everyone move on. So what happened to Ulrike's friend Franz felt almost like an omen. And the experience of this suicide attempt did cause me to have major doubts about whether it was right for me to look at the files. Because while I wanted to know the truth and knew it was important in order to come to terms with what had happened, I didn't think it was worth the human life. So at first I was very unsure of how to proceed. But I believe the truth is more important. I'm really sure of that. Ich hatte nie Zweifel, sondern ich wollte das immer wissen. I just wanted to know. It was very important to me. The snapper turns. Monica meets the man behind the files. The files her need to know down the rabbit hole. Snap judgment. The iron curtain. Stay. Hey, Snap Judgment listeners, Wondery has a great new podcast that's sure to bring a smile to your face. 
The Daily Smile, hosted by Nikki Boyer, will bring you the most unexpected and endearing feel-good stories to start your day in the right way. Like the adorable six-year-old boy who captured hearts across the globe by raiding Shirley Temples, or the cute couple who met and fell in love during a global quarantine. At the end of the show, after the credits, we'll be playing a brief clip from The Daily Smile, but before then, subscribe to The Daily Smile on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To listen ad-free, join Wondery Plus at wonderyplus.com slash smile. Welcome back to Snap Judgment. When we left off, Ulrika Papa revealed some very personal secrets for reporter Louisa Beck. And what Ulrika told Louisa next? Well, you gotta hear that for yourself. As Ulrika and I sifted through a Stasi file, I kept thinking about Franz, the friend turned informant who had tried to commit suicide when he was found out. When seeking the truth, can you go too far? Is it better to dig or leave the past in the past to move on? It felt like a terrible catch-22 because the only way to be sure that you don't want to know something is to know it. Then we came across a name that Olika had always, during all those decades of secrecy, wanted to know. The name is Schiller. Is There's references to a Lieutenant Schiller everywhere. Yeah, that's why you Yes, exactly. So you can see, it's marked Schiller, Schiller, Schiller. Here again, Schiller, Chief Lieutenant Schiller. <laughs> it's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? There's pages and pages signed by him. Yeah, and Inge long geschrieben. Yes, he received them and edited them. Chief Lieutenant Detlef Schiller was the Stasi officer who had been in charge of much of Ulrika's surveillance. It had been his job to know everything there was to know about Ulrika, but she had never even known his name. So when Ulrika fantasized about meeting the Stasi officer, someone who could tell her not just what the Stasi did to her, but why and what they were thinking, she had been talking about Schiller. She just didn't know it. Then, shortly after the wall fell, a former informant told Ulrika that she had recognized Schiller's name in the classified section of a local paper. He was looking for work, and what's more, he had listed a phone number. Of course she wanted to meet him. She had to. I don't think he ever imagined meeting me. He probably didn't even expect me to want to meet him. But I had a thousand questions. Ulrika didn't call Schiller up right away. He had clearly been trying to keep his past a secret. So instead, she arranged a kind of sting operation. She got another friend, a higher up at a good company, to get in touch with him. And my friend suggested that they might. So they went to a bar and I was sitting behind the wall. And I heard my friend say, well, on another subject, Schiller, I have a friend in East Berlin who claims that you were an officer in the state security department. And he paused and then took the Stasi man by the arm and said, She's right here, in this bar. Come with me, let's go and sit at her table. And he sat him next to me and positioned himself in front of us so that the Stasi man couldn't get away. The Stasi officer sat there with a red face and glazed eyes. And I sat next to him and said, Mr. Schiller, you know so much about me, but I don't know anything about you. Would you talk to me? And finally, he just said, somewhat unsteadily. Was wollen Sie denn wissen? Well, what do you want to know? And then we ordered shots. They ended up speaking for hours, and Ulrika finally got to ask her a thousand questions. I wanted to know about who he was, how long he'd been with the state security department, how he viewed himself and his job. How he appraised it ethically and morally. Also, how he viewed us. What was his perspective on the world? How were the Stasi personnel motivated? Why were they the enemy? What were the orders? Although I was obviously also interested in finding out exactly which methods they used. The details, not just the big things like the surveillance and the informants, but the little things, the coincidences. The fact that my bicycle tires were punctured, which was one of these little acts of minor personal terrorism. He confirmed it, and it was important to me to have that confirmation. Ulrika had even more questions, so that night they arranged a second meeting, and then a third, a fourth. He would drive me out to a country pub at the edge of Berlin because he was scared of bumping into friends. I always assured him that I would keep what he told me to myself as long as he wanted me to. If he was so concerned about this getting out, why do you think he was interested in continuing to meet you? Da kann ich jetzt nur spekulieren. I can only speculate about that. Ich glaube, es ging ihm auch. But I think for him it was in part about me understanding him. 
warum er diesen Beruf ausgeübt hat? Why he was in this profession. He tried to explain to me that at the age of 18, he came from a home where it was never up to question that this form of socialism meant happiness for all humankind. And initially he was given great opportunities. He got a good education. He could speak several languages. He was actually at the beginning of a good career. In fact, the Stasi superiors looked after their more junior colleagues. They partied and drank together, celebrated birthdays, and even got involved in the most private aspects of life. So if, for instance, there was a marriage crisis, the bosses helped patch things up. Sie waren so eine Ersatzfamilie. The system was like a surrogate family. And so he had never had any contact with anyone who was critical of the system and would have allowed him to see things differently. But he also wanted to talk with me about the fact that he thought differently about it now and that actually society should give him a chance to start over again. And to Elika, these didn't sound like excuses, like the hypocritical explanations some of her informer friends had offered. Schiller, to her, seemed really sincere. And the more she talked with him, the more she agreed that he deserved a second chance. And I was ready for it. He knew that I didn't approach him as a judge, just as somebody who wanted to know what had happened in his life and in his position in this institution. Yes, I think there was a kind of expectation of healing on both sides. But at their next meeting and the next, Ulrike didn't see any signs of Schiller starting over. If anything, he seemed more and more troubled. He was worried that it would become known at his kid's school that he had worked for the state security. And sometimes he would say things like, my wife doesn't want any of this. It's all very difficult. She doesn't understand me. When Ulrike met Schiller again, he showed up with alcohol on his breath. And the way he drank gave me the impression that he wanted to anesthetize himself. He wasn't like other Stasi officials Ulrike had read and heard about, the ones who found ways to use their Stasi training somewhere else and opened security companies in the West. They didn't dwell on their past. But somebody like him, who really had qualms and who regretted many things about what he did in his life and what he believed in, they can't take it anymore. So he was absolutely desolate. And he took the question of guilt so seriously. And finally, one night, Schiller called her up, not just tipsy, but drunk. Blind drunk. He was really slurring his words. There didn't seem to be anything specific he wanted to speak to me about. So I just asked him how he was doing. He said he was unemployed and that his family had left him. He was completely alone. It was terrible. Ulrike suggested that perhaps Schiller attend something called a restorative justice meeting, where victims and perpetrators of the Stasi era got together and tried to process what had happened. Schiller agreed, but a few days later, he called her back. He told her that he'd spoken with the organizer and asked who else would be sitting there. And he listed Schwane, Zeisweiss, Herger, etc. Das waren alle seine Chefs. They were all Schiller's old bosses. And then he said, I cannot go there. They are sitting there to stop people like me talking. Which turned out to be completely spot on. What do you mean? They're sitting there? Well, they sat in on the sessions and took part in them. But they were sitting there to prevent any Stasi co-workers from disclosing too much. Because state security employees who had spoken out about their work had been threatened. Seriously threatened. It was as though blinders fell from my eyes. The system ensures that no one talks, even today. Ulrike lost track of Schiller after that, but then she got another call about a year later. A friend had stumbled over an obituary. The possibility of being kind of enchained by it? Like, do you think Mr. Schiller was stuck in the past too much? That it was actually damaging? No, I think it was more the present that seemed so bleak to him. His family, his friends, his work, his perspective, his convictions. Everything was gone. With one blow. He started at 18 and at 38 his life was over. And if you don't have support from other people, you can't get over that. So when I heard of his death, I felt sad. And I also blamed myself. I felt I should have maybe done more to help him get back on his feet. But we were just too remote from each other. I was able to offer forgiveness. 
ihm einen Ausweg weisen. But I couldn't show him a way out. Throughout my interview with Ulrike, I kept thinking about my dad. Like Ulrike, like Schiller, he grew up in East Germany. So after the Berlin Wall fell, he put in a request, and the government archive sent him his Stasi file in two big fat binders. When he got it in the mail, he read it once and then burnt it, threw it into a fireplace. He just wanted to leave the past behind and move on with his life. I asked Ulrike if maybe he had the right idea. I asked Mama Schiller, well, everybody has to find their own limit. Those who have the feeling that they haven't made their peace open themselves more towards what happened. But there are many people for whom it's not important to rummage around in the past. And it comes always to an, what is the past? It always depends on what kind of past there is. Thank you so much to Olika Papa for sharing her story with the SNAP. And please note that we've changed certain names in this story to protect their privacy. Thanks as well to the Stasi Records Agency, as well as Mava Flandorfer, Anina Lieben, and voice actor Susan Tackenger for helping bring Ulrika's story to life. A special thanks to the journalist Andrew Curry, whose initial reporting in Wired magazine clued us into this story. And as for Louisa Beck, our faithful reporter, you can find her filing stories for the Washington Post Berlin Bureau. And we're going to have a link to both her and Andrew's work on our website, snapjudgment.org. The original score for that piece was by Renzo Gorio. It was produced by Louisa Beck. Production assistance from Joe Rosenberg. It happened again, Snap. It happened again in a few minutes. Even a moment. Today's Snap Judgment episode. Subscribe. Snap Judgment, the podcast. Subscribe to our podcast that we make for everybody. And if you love Snap storytelling, storytelling currently being made in 20 different houses, not under the same roof. Storytelling made for you. Support it. Go to our Patreon page and help us do what we do best. Patreon.com slash Snap Judgment. Patreon.com slash Snap Judgment. If you have a story you'd like to share with our Snap family, we'd love to hear it. You would. Email us pitches at snapjudgment.org. That's pitches at snapjudgment.org. Snap is brought to you by the team that for sure would escape to the other side of the Berlin Wall. All of us. Except for, of course, the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich. Happy City Miller, Anna Sussman, Lynn Gregorio, John Fasile, Shayna Sheely, Marissa Dodge, Liz Mack, Nick Asin, Eliza Smith, Lauren Newsom, Taylor Decott, Flo Wiley, Nancy Lopez, and Leon Reynolds. This is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you can stick your mother-in-law in the trunk, escape across the wall in all the excitement and drinks and celebration and such, not remember until about 4.30 a.m. sharp the next day exactly where your mother-in-law is. You'd be in trouble, but you'd still, 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 I'd be as far away from the news as this is. But this is WNYC. We're about to play a brief clip from The Daily Smile. But before that, subscribe to The Daily Smile on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To listen ad-free, join Wondery Plus at wonderyplus.com slash smiles. A small drone is flying over a sunny Brooklyn street. The middle of the day in New York City is usually loud and bustling, but not these days. In this new normal we're living in, Brooklyn is eerily quiet. So quiet, you can even hear the buzz of a drone flying overhead. I have a roommate, but he went back with his family in Minnesota, so it's just me and my apartment. That's Jeremy Cohen. He's been alone in his Brooklyn apartment for weeks now, which can be hard for an extrovert like Jeremy, which is how he found himself flying a drone from his balcony to the apartment building across the street. From Wondery, I'm Nikki Boyer, and this is The Daily Smile. Got me feeling, got me feeling good. Okay, kiddos, today's smile is about a guy who found a very unique way to not feel so alone. I'm a really outgoing social guy, so I'm used to just like bopping around the city and like going to different events. Jeremy Cohen is in his 20s and comes from a smallish town in Pennsylvania, but he looks like he's lived in Brooklyn his entire life. He's got a hipster beard, skinny pants, and an overall artsy sort of vibe. One day, while Jeremy was isolating at home... I was sitting at my desk and working on the computer or something. There was a window right next to my desk, and I saw her out of the corner of my eye. What was she doing? She was dancing. The first word that comes to mind is, like, vortex. Very strange word. I don't know. She was, like, kind of moving her hips around while her arms were waving around simultaneously in the opposite direction. Kind of like a tornado. 
I honestly thought she was dancing to a TikTok song because I recently got into TikTok. I started posting videos on it like in February. So Jeremy was into the silly dance the girl on the roof was doing. And even if he hasn't had many serious girlfriends lately, he isn't shy. I mean, I'm kind of just like a flirt with everyone, to be honest. I, I love people, so I'm just like, I'll, I'll go up to anyone and say hi. This kind of takes flirting to a whole new level, what you did, so it's <laughs> awesome. So, okay, what happened next? I went out on my balcony and waved to her, and she kind of waved back, and we smiled at each other. So, right. kind of yelled at her, and I was like, hey, I want to send you something right there. So, Jeremy has a drone. He's a photographer and uses it for aerial photos. I was immediately attracted to this energy because, you know, it's a very like strange and sad times and it's okay to feel sad about that. A lot of us are sad about it. I'm sad about it. I don't talk to anyone, you know? So this was a person I, all of a sudden I was in contact with them and I needed to get in touch with her. Yeah, so that's when I ran up to my roof and flew my drone across the street and landed it on her roof. So what was her reaction? She looked excited, and then we kind of like, smiled and waved at each other. Taped to the bottom of the drone was a piece of paper with Jeremy's phone number. Then she texted me about an hour later. <laughs> and what did the text say? To listen to the rest of the episode, click the link in the show description, or subscribe to The Daily Smile and other great podcasts from Wondery on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. To listen ad-free, join